We're going to go ahead and take our Bibles and go to the Gospel of John, chapter number 5, this morning. And as we come to this account, uh, it's the healing of the lame man. Um, I think of the saying that father time and mother nature are not very good, good kind parents. And uh, that's the way it is uh, with our bodies. They tend to wear down with age, and, and that's true of everybody. A number of years ago, there was a guy by the name of Paul Anderson. He was called the world's strongest man. I remember this guy way, way back. Uh, he was a weightlifter. He had actually won an Olympic gold medal in the 1956 Olympics for weightlifting. He's also in the Guinness Book of World Records uh, for setting the record of lifting more than three tons of weight on his back. Paul Anderson was a, a good Christian. He had a great testimony for Christ. And, and yet, uh, as time went on, here's a guy, strongest man on earth, and his kidneys began to fail, and uh, he died. And he went to be with the Lord at the age of 61. So the strongest man on earth could not keep his body from winding down to the grave. And the truth is, if Jesus tarries his coming, that that's the same way it'll be for you and I. We're going to also taste death, no matter how uh, much strength and health we may have today. The latest statistic I read on, on uh, death is one out of one die. Okay, that's the latest statistic. And uh, we're told in Isaiah 40, verse 30, that even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. So all human beings are going to ultimately fall. But the Bible gives us glorious hope. I love that verse in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, where Paul wrote, though, though our outward man perish, that's talking about our physical body, and as time goes on, it's gradually perishing. It's, it's wearing out. But he said this, yeah, the inward man, is renewed day by day. And there's no such thing as a fountain of youth for the body. Okay, Pilate de Leon had that wrong. No fountain, they're, 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 and so some thought that way, but there isn't. There is not a fountain of youth for the body, but thank God there is one for the soul. There is one for the soul. And the key question is not what's going to happen to your body one day. We know what's going to happen to our body one day. The question is what's going to happen to your soul. Do we have the spiritual strength to be what God wants us to be? Now, this account we're going to look at today from John 5, we are told of the healing of a paralyzed man. And this miracle shows us the inner strength that only the Lord Jesus Christ can give. In a spiritual sense, there is healing for our spiritual paralysis. And we can have spiritual power to live a life of victory. Now, in verse 1, John links this miracle we're going to look at now with the healing of the nobleman's son we saw last time in the previous chapter. He says this, after this. So that's looking back uh, to what just happened. It's, it's, he had just dealt with human doubt and the answer to that. And now Jesus prepares to deal with human disability. Let's take a look at it here in verse 1. He says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season in the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. All right, now. Let's begin by looking at the setting for this miracle, okay? The word Bethesda is a word that means literally the house of mercy. This poor man we're looking at today was about to experience the mercy of God in a miraculous way because Jesus was going to help him. He passed his way. Now, I, looked, I visited this pool when I was over in Jerusalem uh, back in 2019, and the, the, it's actually right inside the sheep gate, just as the, this is indicating here in the text, the pool is still there. It's only about 40 feet below what, where the street level was back in Jesus' day. So you, you got to go down about 40 feet, but it's still there. And in Jesus' day, the pool of Bethesda was kind of like a health spa. You had all these porches that, uh, that the text indicates here around the pool. They were, they were full of sick, pe sick people, men and women, with all kinds of spiritual excuse me, physical maladies, they were all there waiting and hoping for a miracle. It appeared that once a year, when the water was stirred up by this angel of God, God in his mercy would perform a miracle of healing on the very first person 
who stepped into the water. I'm not sure about all the, the significance of that, but a question is, is often raised about this, and it is this. Why doesn't Jesus heal everybody? He only healed one person a year in this case. Why not everybody? Jesus came to Jerusalem during an unspecified feast here, and he went to this pool of Bethesda. And when it was there that he fixed his eyes, his attention on a certain man, as the Bible says here. This guy had been paralyzed for 38 long years, according to verse 5. Now, there were many sick people around there that day, but Jesus focused on just this one man because Jesus had a purpose in mind and he had a lesson he was about to teach. He was going to perform an amazing miracle here, but it had a message for every one of us today. We don't know how long this man had been lying there beside that pool of Bethesda. We don't know what he'd been, uh, how, you know, very possible he could have been coming to that pool uh, for years, right? Every year it, 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 this took place, trying to get closer to the pool to be the first guy that could get into the water. But, but here's the thing. Jesus knew all about this man. He knew how long he had been in this condition. And so the Lord asked him a very simple question, and yet it was very profound. Look at it here in verse 6. He said this, Wilt thou be made whole? What he's asking him is, Hey, do you want to be healed? All right? Now, that's a question that I think our Lord is still asking people today because this man's condition is a picture of the spiritual condition of multitudes of lost people today. Now, before we get into this miracle and, and look at it real carefully here, it's very important to keep in mind that Jesus was not merely in the healing business. What in the healing business primarily? If he was, he would have healed everybody that was laying by the pool that day. We are told here in verse 3 that there was a great multitude of, of invalid people that were there on that occasion. But Jesus only healed this one guy, this one certain man. In fact, as we're going to see in just a short while, back up in verse 13, that after the healing took place, Jesus just silently slipped away. He didn't want any fanfare. Had he stayed, the people no doubt would have clamored after him to be the next one in line to be healed. But of course, we know this, that, uh, that if Jesus was interested in being a great healer, he would have gone from person to person by the pool that day, and he would have healed every last one of them. But he only healed this one guy because, because he was teaching a great lesson of which, as, you know, of which this healing was only a symbol. The Lord Jesus did not come to this earth as the great healer. That's not why he came. He came as the great Savior. Now, I made a statement in the first message of this series. I talked about the great late expositor guy by the name of G. Campbell Morgan, and he made an observation that I believe was on the money. He said that every parable Jesus taught was a miracle of instruction, while every miracle that Jesus wrought was a parable of instruction. He did not mean by that statement that miracles were not real. He was just saying that there was a message in every one of the miracles of Christ. There was a main message, and, and, uh, and so we see that in this series. And John made that clear, and we see it here again in this miracle that took place at the Pool of Bethesda. The Lord healed this invalid man in order to get a message across to the, to the folks and the saints for ages to come that uh, what, what was the message he was going to send. Very clearly that, that uh, wait, hey, wait a minute, we can't do it ourselves, right? There's a, there, the Lord healed this man in order to get this message that we who are spiritually lame and are, are without strength and we need him. That includes all of us because by nature we are paralyzed spiritually. We are, we are without strength apart from the Lord Jesus, but in him, that's when we have spiritual power. That's when we can live for Christ because he is God's answer to our spiritual disability. He's the one that can help us. Now, there's something else we need to see here by way of introduction uh, to this account here in John 5. The physical healing of this man, remember now, it was only temporary. Okay? I mean, when we get sick, of course, um, uh, that, that happens too. We, a lot of times it's temporary because we have God gives us a great immune system. But, but here's the thing now. Later on, this guy still died, and, and perhaps not too many years later because he had been this way for 40 years. The point is the physical healing was at best temporary. 
And when we get sick, we want to get better as soon as possible. I'm sure we've all noticed this too, that, you know, in the average church prayer meeting, uh, the prayer requests are usually going to go like, we'll pray for sister so-and-so. And and, uh, doctor says she's in critical condition. She might've had much longer to live. Pray for brother Smith. He's got cancer. He's not doing well. And on and on that goes. And that's, that's fine. That is, that is great. We should ask for prayer for those folks in every instance. If I'm sick, I sure do want people to pray for me, and I'm sure you're the same way. Um, but the question is, the whole point I'm making here is, how many prayers are offered for the lost in our community that they may be saved, or for the backslidden brothers and sisters in Christ that they be restored to fellowship with the Lord? That also be, ought, to, ought to be on our hearts and our minds, and, and intercede for other people concerning the spiritual health that they're in. Not just the physical, but the spiritual health that they may have Christ to help them with their spiritual disabilities. Now, obviously, we think that recovering physical health is is very important. It is important, but you know something? God doesn't always think it's as important as we do. Uh, God is a whole lot more concerned with our spiritual health. The Lord may have a different and a greater plan in mind for us than to be having robust health, okay? But there is an example of this. You go to Mark chapter 2, and there's the account of another guy that was paralyzed. He was brought to the Lord Jesus that day by four of his friends, had him on a cot, took him up, couldn't get through the crowd, so they went up on the roof, rolled down through the roof, and uh, laid the guy down on this stretcher. And there's Jesus looking at that guy lying there, and he said to that guy that day, Son, thy sins be forgiven me. Now, as soon as he said that, the religious Pharisees, of course, uh, got all upset, began to criticize Jesus, and they said, in effect, who does this man think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Well, they they were right about that part. (laughs) Only God can forgive sins. But they were wrong when they thought that Jesus wasn't God. He was. And that's why he could forgive sins. So to prove who he was... Jesus said to that paralyzed man in Mark 2, verse 11, Arise and take up your bed and go your way into your house. What was happening there? Well, the Lord healed that man in order to attest to the greater spiritual miracle he had just performed in forgiving him of his sin. That's what was happening. Jesus did something that people could see that day so they might understand and believe that which they could not see, the healing of the soul. Now, the most important thing to the Lord Jesus that day in Mark chapter 2 was not healing that man's body, but it was healing his soul. Again, every one of these physical healings we're seeing was the one last week is the same way. The physical healing on every one of these occasions did not last forever. The paralyzed man's, this guy even in this account, died later on, but the spiritual healing of his soul would last for all of eternity. And there's your big difference. Now, here in John 5, we learn three things that we need to do if we're going to experience spiritual power uh, that God gives us to, to have this victory over our disabilities. And there's a message in that, this miracle for you and I today. And I want us to look at this. So, number one, by way of outline, I would say this. We must validate our weakness. That's the first step. I mean, the very first thing we have to do if we uh, are, fi- are going to find a spiritual strength that we need is to admit that we are weak. We have to admit that. As the old song goes, Jesus loves me. We sang in Sunday school, still love to sing it today. Jesus loves me. And then we go on to say, we are weak, but he is strong. We have to admit that. The fact that this man was lying by the pool of Bethesda was an admission of his weakness. That's where I'm getting this point from. He realized that he needed a miracle to cure him of his weakness it wouldn't have done him any good to deny his disability. He wouldn't have been there if he didn't, didn't know that he had a disability. When you are physically unable to move under your own power, your paralysis, your lack of strength is going to be evident to everybody. This man readily admitted to Jesus that he was too weak to make it into the pool on his own. And he's basically saying that in verse number 7. When I try to get down to that pool... Another person steps down before me. So that was his problem. And that's the problem that many people have today. 
They don't want to admit their weaknesses. They don't want to admit that they're spiritually paralyzed. People will not validate their weakness. But even if we could hide our spiritual paralysis from other people, we'll never be able to hide it from God. The first step in being healed from any spiritual weakness is to admit it. Now, we, uh, we can admit it. Uh, we, we, we see it in the Bible. We are told in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's a great verse. That's saying that, that there was a time before we got saved when we were without any spiritual strength whatsoever. And yet, in due time, we trusted Jesus, and, and he, he died for us, and we, we trusted him, and he saved us, and he gave us that strength that we need. The Bible describes every unsaved person without Christ as being without strength. That's how it is stated in that text. And listen, even as believers, we sometimes get this idea that, that yes, we needed, while we needed Jesus to save us, after that, you know, man, this is great, I'm saved. I'll just be able to take it from here and live the Christian life in my own strength. And that's a big mistake. That's where we're wrong. There is no way any one of us can live the Christian life in our own strength. There's no way. Why? Because we have an old Adamic sin nature that's still there. You see, folks, our flesh is as sinful and weak today as it was before we came to Christ and got saved. The old nature doesn't change a bit. I mean, we were still, we still got that, that weakness there, that, that old man that's there. All right? So here's the thing. Jesus did not come and save you and me to remodel our old nature or to remove it, but to give us power over it. That's why he came. And so if we try to live our Christian life in the strength of our own flesh, it ought to come as no surprise to us that we are so spiritually weak that we're going to fall on our face every single day. Now let me quickly give you three truths that we cannot deny and we cannot dodge, but we must admit. Here's the first one. The prime, what is the primary source of our weakness? What, what is it that causes you and I to be spiritually weak? Well, they, we, we find the answer up here in verse 14 of chapter 5. Look at what it says here. It says that, at, that afterward, Jesus findeth him, same guy that he had healed in the temple. Later on, he's in the temple. And he said to him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now, the primary source of this man's weakness, according to this verse, was his sin. I mean, that's, you know, in, now I want to say this too, not everybody is sick because they've sinned. But evidently, that's what happened to this man. And that's probably the reason why Jesus picked him out. This man's sin and his weakness had a direct connection or else Jesus would not have given him such a direct warning in verse number 14. Now, we all know this from the Word of God. We are sinners by birth. We are sinners by nature, sinners by choice, and sinners by practice. The source of all spiritual disability is our sin. And we have to admit that. Now, people that don't admit it, got, they still have problems, serious problems. And that's what happens a lot of times. People want to rename it. They want to take the word sin and take it out of their vocabulary, out of their dictionary. They want to call it a mistake or a bad judgment or a physical, or excuse me, a psychological maladjustment or a glandular malfunction. Anything but what it is, sin. And so the problem is going to persist until a person with absolute honesty admits it, they're a sinner, they've sinned, and then confess that sin to God. That's when you can get victory and cleansing. Now, that's the first thing. And then there's a second thing we got to do, and that, there, as you see, is that's the paralyzing force of our weakness. Primary source of our weakness is sin. What's the paralyzing force of our weakness? Now, a lot of people don't realize that they are spiritually paralyzed. Again, Romans 5, verse 6 tells us that Christ died for those who are weak, who are without strength, and Paul calls those people the ungodly. But what is our weakness when it comes right down to it? Well, our weakness is that we don't have the strength 
in and of ourselves to be godly. We just don't. We were created, we know from the Bible, to bear the image of Christ. Godliness is when we simply reflect the image and the glory of Christ in our life. So sin is when, as the Bible says, is coming short of the glory of God. Sin is that gap. Yet the gap between our lifestyle and the glory of God, that is the source of our weakness as we just saw. So what is the Lord's plan for his children today? For you and me who are saved? Well, his plan, we know, is that we be godly and that we be holy like he is holy. That's why he says in 1 Peter 1, 16, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So we see that verse, and we say, okay, there's what, that's what God wants, to be holy like he is, but I got, you know, we don't have the strength within ourselves to be godly, to be holy. No matter how hard we try, we just don't have what it takes to be godly. We don't have enough strength uh, to be holy. We may be strong enough to do what we want, but we're not strong enough to do what we ought. So the primary source of our weakness, that's sin. The paralyzing force is that we can't be what God wants to be on our own. And then here's the third thing I want you to see, and that's the persistent course of our weakness. According to verse 5, this poor guy had been in this condition for 38 years. Now, when a person is paralyzed for that long, what happens to his muscles? They begin to atrophy. You got, you got that there. They, you know, you got, they get, the muscles begin to wither away. Over time, this guy had gotten worse, not any better. The, and the longer lost people live without Jesus Christ, the worse their condition becomes, the harder their heart gets. That's why we encourage young people to come to Jesus. That's why uh, no one should ever put off receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. The same thing is true, I believe, for Christians as well when you think about it. The longer we try to live for Jesus in our own strength, the weaker we will become. It can't happen. We won't, it won't work that way. The first step to spiritual healing is to validate our weakness, to admit it, to say, Dear God, you are right. I am without strength, without Jesus. I need you. Please forgive me and strengthen me. So I, I can have victory. Let's go to the second thing this morning. We want to, if we want God to do a miracle for us to replace our disability with his strength and his ability, then not only must we validate our weakness and admit it, but number two, we must activate our will. That's the second thing involved here. Look at verse 6. Jesus asked this man in verse number 6, when he saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made Whole. In other words, what is your, you say to this guy, what is your will in this man? The Lord wanted him to activate his will. You see, folks, God never forces you and I to choose his way. He will enable us, but he will not coerce us. You are not a machine. You are not a robot. All right? We know that from the Bible. We are a person. And God can only have fellowship with a person. So there is a choice to be made. If you want to come to Jesus, you may. But if you don't want to come to Jesus, here's the, he's not going to force you. The last invitation of the Bible is this. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. In John 7, 37, Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. So God has given us a will. And Jesus is saying to this lame man, do you want to be made whole? Now, I realize that this is a theological minefield right here. Many theologians react to this idea of a human free will because they think, well, that negates God's sovereignty. You say, you've heard me say this many times. I'll say it again. I, I believe in both. Because the sovereignty of God and the free will of man are both taught in Scripture. You say, well, explain that to me. I can't. That's a mystery. Our human mind can't comprehend that. There's an old story about a room full of preachers who were discussing theology one day, and, and they got into this heated argument like so many others have over the course of church history, over the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. 
Some said, well, nobody can choose. God does the choosing from eternity past, and he has predestined some for heaven and some for hell. But other preachers said, wait a minute. The Bible says that whosoever will may come. And the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The argument got so heated, the preachers separated into two holy huddles on each side of the room. And, uh, but there was one preacher, poor preacher, that was caught in the middle. He didn't go to either side at first. He, he, I mean, when he heard the sovereignty, he couldn't make up his mind. When he heard the sovereignty preachers talk, they sounded so right. But then when he heard the free will preachers talk, he thought that sounded pretty good too. He had to choose. So he chose the group that argued for the sovereignty of God and against human free will. So the preachers saw him coming and they said, hey, why did you hesitate? Why did you finally come over here? He said, well, I just chose to. I came with my own free will. Then you don't belong to our group, they told him. Go over there with those other fellows. So the confused preacher went over to the other group. They saw him coming. They said, hey, why are you coming over here? Well, they, they sent me over. It wasn't my choice. And they said, well, you can't come over here unless you come of your own free will. <laughs> There's your problem. Now, God is sovereign. We know that. And I want to say this. I believe that God is sovereign enough to give a person a free will without losing his sovereignty. You say, explain that to me. I can't. That's a mystery. And here in John 5, Jesus is teaching us that he will not force himself upon anybody. And by the way, the Lord wasn't asking him if he wanted to walk again. The word whole means literally fullness or wholesomeness. Jesus was offering this man more than a pair of strong legs. He was offering him spiritual as well as physical wholeness. He was offering this guy the forgiveness of sin. So this man had a choice to make here. And a person can, and I want to say a person can die and go to hell, even though Jesus stretches out his arms to that, to that person and asks, will you be made whole? We have to activate our will in order to receive what Jesus offered. And then there's a third truth we can see here as well. If we would have our disability replaced by Jesus Christ's strength, and here's the third thing we have to do. We must initiate our walk. And we see this here beginning in verse 7. Look at that with me. It says, The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth thou before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, notice here that Jesus not only offered this man a choice, but then he commanded him to do something. Jesus did not help this guy to his feet or fold up his mat for him. This man had to initiate his walk. Now, I want you to notice something. Getting up and walking didn't cause him to be healed. He was, had already been healed by the power of Christ. You look at the words here. That's what we see here. It says first that he was made whole, then he took up his bed. So you got to get the order right, the order that God gives us right here. This man initiated his walk. But walking simply demonstrated his faith that he had been made whole. And that is what we see in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 in Paul's classic statement of salvation. There the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good work. Now, there, those three verses right there are built around three key prepositions. Here they are by, through, and unto. The order of those things is so important. How was this lame man made whole? By grace. There was nothing he could do. He was paralyzed. He could not help himself physically or spiritually, but he was immediately made whole that day. Salvation is by the sheer grace of God. 
Now, if we were standing there that day and heard, heard our Lord commanding this guy these, with these words, we would have, we might have thought, well, how can Jesus tell this guy to just get up? If he, if he could have gotten up and walked, he would have done it a long time ago, like, like 38 years ago. Wow, it sure looks like Jesus is being impossible here and unreasonable. But Jesus does what is humanly impossible and humanly unreasonable. Because with him, all things are possible. Jesus can save a lost sinner against all possibility and all reason because salvation is by God's amazing grace. And then the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 8, that salvation is also through faith. This crippled man exercised his faith when he obeyed our Lord's command to get up, take his bed, and walk away. And again, getting up and doing those things did not make him whole. He had already been made whole by the grace of God. But he still had to exercise his faith by initiating his walk. So the Lord Jesus was basically saying to this crippled man, just obey me. Just trust me. And so the man put his faith in Christ into action. He got up. And right there we can see that genuine faith is belief with legs on it. That's what it is. And we see that, of course, in James's epistle. We see it in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We see that right there. And so then Ephesians 2 and verse 10 tells us that we're saved unto good works. So there's the order. By grace, through faith, unto good works. We are saved for the purpose of doing good works, not for our glory, but for God's. The verb Jesus used in, the, in this verse here, when he's taught, telling this man to get up and walk, is actually in the Greek present tense, meaning it's a verb of continuous action, not just a single step. What our Lord was saying to this guy was, walk, get up and walk, and keep on walking. That's what he was saying. So was this man healed because he walked, or did he walk because he was healed? <laughs> Clearly, he walked because he was healed. And the truth is, we are not saved by doing good works. We are saved to do good works. In a doubt, salvation is by grace, through faith, unto good works. And you can't get that out of order. If you try to, it won't work for you. People that try to get that out of order, they never get saved. And that's what religion does. I've got to do these things. You know, I got to do these works, these religious sacraments, all these things in order to get to heaven. No. By grace, through faith, unto good works. Now, here's the thing Jesus is the answer to our spiritual disability. That is why we have to go beyond the, the miracle to Jesus himself. We cannot, folks, possibly live the Christian life until we do trust Jesus Christ as our Savior and have his Holy Spirit living in our heart. That's the only way it's possible to live for Jesus. I think of what Colossians 2 and verse 6 says. As you have received, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Okay, there you got it. How, how did we receive Jesus? By grace through faith. And how do we walk in him as a believer? The same way. By grace, through faith. And once we understand that truth, we're going to receive the strength we need to live supernaturally. God will replace our disability with his ability. Now, as great as this miracle of John 5 is, we need to remember this again, that Jesus did not come to this earth to be the great healer. He came to be the great Savior. Jesus came as God's remedy for our spiritual disability. And this miracle is given to underscore that truth. And again, we do not follow Jesus so that he can perform some miracle for us. We don't follow him so that he can, he can do wonderful things for us. We follow him because he is the Son of God, our Savior who loves us and gave himself for us. And in this day of New Age mysticism and all these religious frauds out there preaching a health and wealth gospel on television, we had better get 
a firm grip on Jesus Christ alone. And if we'll admit our weakness and activate our will and initiate our walk by coming to him in faith, we'll find him to be the answer for all of our spiritual discipline. Let's bow our heads together. Closing. Gracious Heavenly Father, today we are just here to praise you and thank you for the great work that you do in our lives. We think of that most amazing miracle of all when you regenerated our heart, saved us by your amazing grace, gave us that supernatural life in Christ. Father, I thank you for this text today that reminds us that even as believers, we can't do it alone. We can't do it by ourselves. We need Jesus. As we receive them, we have to walk in him. So I pray today, Lord, there's anyone here in this room or at the sound of my voice that doesn't have Christ in their heart, who are without strength, I pray you'll work in their heart, save them, convict them, draw them, we pray by your spirit to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then for us today in this room who are believers, I pray, God, that we'll realize we can't do this by ourselves. We can't live the Christian life in our own strength and hope to have victory. Lord, I pray you'll help us all to realize we must come to Jesus. He's the one. He's the answer. We have to depend upon him each and every moment of every day. In his precious name, we pray.